me during the conference. Um, but today, today I'm here to, to talk about uh, a library, Scala Check, um, which, you know, if, you, if you're from a, maybe a, a, an imperative background, you might not be too familiar with or perhaps a bit intimidated. Um, do people know Scala Check? Quick raise of hands. Do people not know Scala Check? Okay, all right, so what's that? I think it was about 30%. Do people know Scala Check but don't know how to use it? Great, okay, that's, that's exactly what this talk is going to do. So it's going to go over the basics of Scala Check, show you how to use it, and then hopefully show a few um, ways of thinking and, and, and approaches to, to getting the best out of, out of, the, uh, out of the library. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, is that legible? I don't know why I'm asking because I can't really do anything about the size, but if it's not, come, come closer. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what, what ScalaCheck is, uh, the key classes that people find in ScalaCheck, and then this third section here, writing properties, that's where I'm going to spend most of the time of how, how to actually write some meaningful tests. Um, we'll finish off with a few tips and techniques, and then finally my favorite thing, which is uh, boilerplate reduction. Okay, so what is Scala Check? So here's, here's an example. Um, all, the, all this code's up on GitHub, so if you don't believe me that it works, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the links afterwards. Okay, so um, it's a, it's a property-based testing framework. So what that means is rather than coming up with code that we know should pass for our tests, we provide some rules. So we say, I think that this property or this rule should always hold for what I write. And then what will happen is when we run our test, ScalaCheck will provide some sample data in order to make our assumptions valid, or at least check that they're valid. Um, and so we, we generally use this method here called for all. And we then, what we'll see here is we can, we can pass a parameter of some type and then we provide a rule, which is ge generally a Boolean, um, but it, it, there's an implicit that, that makes it what, what's called a property. And then, so here we can see, so, say for instance, we were writing some properties, we wanted to test some functionality on strings, and, and this is a property that I think should hold, that whatever, whatever string we're given, the length of the string should never be negative. Um, it's not the most comprehensive test or the best test, but this is something that should always hold. If this doesn't hold, then we've got a problem somewhere. Okay? And so this gives us a prop object. We can call check on that. And then what happens is Scala check gives us 100 strings. Some will be empty. Some will be really long. Some will be kanji. Some will be regular characters. Some will be numbers. Some more will be empty, and so on. And it generally gives us, by default, 100 strings. And it makes sure that that property holds for all strings. And this just works out of the box with SBT. So if we just have a, a properties object and define our properties in there, when we write SB te SBT test, these properties get run. Okay? So that's a very, very brief example. So, so what, what is ScalaCheck? The way I like to think about it is it's a bridge between types and values. I like to see this as the way that we want to make assertions that for some reason our type or the type system cannot really enforce for us. So imagine if we were working in a really, you know, really basic way and we wanted to do some tests with Booleans, we wouldn't write a test that made sure things either returned true or false because the type system holds that for us. However, say we're working with integers, um, although there are types that will only ever give us positive numbers, if, say, we're constrained to work with ints, but we want our library to only be positive, then this is where this would be used. This is kind of constraining or, or working between the types and the values. That, that's really what I mean by this. So if you have, um, if you have a little secret class or file in your, in your application, in your code base, with, with all your test data and your stub data and you know, some nice little objects that you've created, you should be using ScalaCheck instead. That's what this does. And this will be probably be thinking of better cases that you can do. You know, let's, let's kind of use the, the technology to, to, to write this for us. OK? And uh, maybe a bit more wishy-washy. Uh, the way I like to think about it is a conversation between 
the computer and yourself. It's a conversation between your implementation and your tests. ScholarCheck will find issues, and then sometimes it's up to you to say, am I testing this right? Is my coverage correct? Or actually, is this a proper, proper failure in my, in my implementation? And you might find here that there's some questions being asked about some really core fundamentals to the way you, you describe your APIs in the first place. And ScholarCheck's quite good at uncovering those. And we'll see a few of those in a minute. OK, it's very thorough. Uh, annoyingly thorough sometimes where you know you, you you fix an error and you're great and then there's another one and another one and another one and you know how far how far down the rabbit hole are you are you often prepared to, to go and what is scholar check not it's not a random library if you want code that produces random values don't use scholar check it is not normally distributed it tends to focus around kind of natural edge cases so if you're looking at integers you'll tend to find that the uh, Scala check will generate lots of zeros and ones, minus ones, integer maximum, integer minimum, those kind of things. It will give random numbers in between those, but it tends to focus on those. So if you want random, don't use this. It's not a silver bullet. If you use Scala check, it's not going to find everything for you. you know, it's only as good as whoever's driving it. So if you write noddy tests, if we just write tests like the first one I showed you, Clearly, that does not cover everything that is needed for a length uh, functionality for strings. But you know, it, it just helps provide an extra way of thinking about it and, 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 and the like. It's not fast. Uh, I'm not going to describe what that means. I'm going to leave that to you to, to think exactly what, what I've meant by that there. OK, so a couple more examples. Here's, a, here's a, another fair one. So. We're using for all again, and this time we're passing in an integer. Absolute function, that seems fair enough. Whatever value ScholarCheck gives us, if we call the absolute function, it should be greater than or equal to zero. But no, no, this fails. Does anybody know what this number is? Yeah? Yeah, do you know why it's failing? Yes. Yes, that's right. So there's, there's one more negative value in the integer type. Than, than, and so negating that just give, gives the same value. So, so right away here, this is what I meant by there's a conversation. You know, if we were writing this absolute method, you know, ScholarCheck said, look, there's a problem with what you've written here. It's up to you to figure out what the problem is. Like what, there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of ways we could solve this. So one way could be, well, actually, we've got the type signature of absolute wrong. Perhaps it should be it should return an option, and if you give it negative, then it produces none. And otherwise, you know, the, these are conversations, and these are things that, that you need to think about. Of course, there are other ways, and maybe slightly more logical ways to fix this. Is that we can constrain what ScholarCheck generates using this operator here, which is called implication. And so we could say something like this: is that as long as our value is greater than the minimum value then run our test. And every time ScholarCheck generates a value that this predicate doesn't hold, it just skips it and moves on to the next. And now we see that our test pass again. Here's another example. So we've written a reverse method for lists, which we've, we've managed to have a bit of a bug. Um, clearly, clearly, this is very contrived and just for, for the slides. But say, for instance, there's some kind of bug here that if we ever try to reverse a list that's greater than four elements long, it doesn't actually reverse it. So then, regardless of this, this, this I think is a, is a fair property of a reverse method. Is that the head of a list, when reversed, is the tail of a list. Yeah? I think that's, that's fair. Whatever lists are passed, that should work. And then, of course, we want to say here that we want to make sure that we're not dealing with empty lists for this case. And so, clearly, this test will fail. And, and this, is, this is some sample output from when I, when I created these slides. Um, so what we've got here is actually, it's given us two lists back. And ScholarCheck said, well, this original, this, this is what ScholarCheck generated and made the test fail. And then what it did is that it managed to, what, what's called shrinking, and that it shrunk the input in order to find what it believes to be the smallest data set that causes our test to fail. 
And so it managed to shrink this to, to this list here. And notice here that this original list actually has six elements in it. And Scholarcheck has shrunk this down and said, actually, it fails with five elements as long as there's a value here that's, as long as th there's a value in this list. So clearly, if these were all zeros, the test passes. If the one would be in the middle, the test would pass. It said, you know, if, if there's a, a value not in the middle or, or all the values are the same, then this passes. So I think this, this makes life a little bit easier to work with when we're trying to debug what's actually happened here. Although, again, this is quite a contrived example. You know, if we're dealing with much larger, richer domain objects, shrinking it down like this can be, can be quite useful. Is everything OK so far? Is this all making sense? Yep. OK, there's another, another example here. So um, say we want to concatenate two lists. Um, you might believe this to be a, a, a fair property, is that when you concatenate the lists, then the length of the concatenated list should be greater than the first list. Okay. But of course, no, that fails, because we can concatenate empty lists. And of course, the length is not, is not less than that. So what we can do is we could use this implication again, or we could try something else. And that is we could use some generators. And what we can say is when we generate our lists, we want to tell ScalaCheck how to do the generation. And so we'll look at these in a bit more depth in a minute. But there's this gen object, and we want to say, well, actually, let's create a non-empty list. And then I don't care what's in the list. We just have some arbitrary integers. And then we want two of these. And then these are the parameters here. And now we, we can, we, th this test should hold. And you know, again, maybe, maybe this is slightly contrived, but hopefully you could see some situations where this would be useful, where we want to generate some data, but actually we want a little bit of control over how that uh, data is generated. So we'll look at these classes in a little bit more depth. So gen. So gen stands for generator. As we've just seen, it can be used to produce any value for a particular type or a subset of those values. So we saw there with generating non-empty lists, we're actually just generating a, a subset of these lists. It's a monad, so that means we can use these together to create some, some new generators with, with relative ease. And Skullcheck itself ships with a lot of these generators. So generally, you'll find that if you're dealing with a lot of the, the kind of core types in the Scala language, generators for those will probably already exist. So we'll just have a very, very brief look at some of these now. OK? So if we want to generate strings, but we want those to only contain letters, this will produce upper and lower case uh, letters only, never numbers, never Unicode, never emoji, things like that. We can specify that we only want positive numbers to be created. So we've already seen some use cases earlier where we, we were looking at only, only wanting positive numbers. And notice here that this works for, for any type where there, there is a, a numeric uh, type class instance. So this works with integers. It works with doubles, floats. You could write your own numeric type to maybe work with some of the numeric types from Spire, um, things like that. Okay? We can provide our own list of data and then tell ScalaCheck randomly select from that list. So for instance, this could work quite well in, say, an integration test where We'd have a, a setup method as part of our test to maybe connect to a database and, and um, run a select statement on a table, put that in a list, and then we can have a generator that, that, say, uses that data. List of, so we can actually provide a list of generators. And th this is quite similar to the one above. So quite similar in that we can give it a list of generators. It will then arbitrarily pick a generator and then provide a list of generated values for, for that. OK? List of n, same as before, we can specify we want the list to be a certain length. And then there's one in a different class, and that is arbitrary. So this is, uh, this is using uh, the arbitrary type class, which we're going to look at. But it's saying, if there's an arbitrary instance for our type, then we can just automatically generate values for that. And this, again, exists for most of the types 
in the core Scala language, so we could say arbitrary string, and that will produce any string, rather than, you know, if we want a specific string, we don't want to use arbitrary. We want to, want to look at using these generators. We'll look at this in a, in a little bit more depth in a minute. So on the console, we can, we can pull some data from, from these generators with the sample method. Notice here, this actually is an option of the type for the generator, because there's a chance the generator might be, uh, the, the pool of data might be exhausted, or Scala Check has just worked out that whatever you do, you can't actually create a valid, valid um, data for, for what you're looking, looking to do. Okay? Like I said, gen, gen is a monad, so we can combine these generators to create even richer generators. So say, for instance, we wanted to, our, our domain or our tests required that we wanted a, so maybe some kind of name. So we'd want a capitalized first letter and then all the rest lowercase. And this is one way we could do that. So uh, an arbitrary character that's always going to be an uppercase one, and then a list of lowercase characters, we concatenate those and make it a string. And then we've got a new generator for strings that, that matches exactly what we want. And then this just works as you'd expect. So we call sample, and then we get nice, nice strings that are full of lowercase letters, but the first one is always going to be capitalized. As I mentioned, the arbitrary type class, that allows these generators to be implicitly summoned. So we can create our own types. So we could have a record, and then we, we um, take an alpha string generator, and then we just map that onto this record type. And now we have a generator for records. And then we can create an implicit for this, for, for this generator just by wrapping it in an arbitrary class. And then what this allows us to do is this, is that we can call for all with our new type. So if you look at the implementation for for, for all, it, there's an implicit parameter which expects there to be an arbitrary for the type. So here, as, lo as long as the, the compiler can find the implicit arbitrary for records, the test will then generate records for us. Okay, So we can just use this uh, like so. So arbitrary record uh, gives us generators, so we can call sample on those. And then the question is, you know, what, there's, a, there's almost like a little bit of a mismatch here, or a, a clash almost between generators, where we've seen we can have lots of different generators for the same type. And then, of course, generally, you only want one arbitrary or one implicit for a given type. So a question is, you know, which generator should we use for a particular arbitrary? And then, as a rule, you want to have the generator that produces a full range of values. So you don't, you know, if, if say, for instance, we had a type which took numbers, negative numbers were valid, but our arbitrary only ever produced positive numbers, then there's a whole class of data that we're missing from our test there. OK, so now I want to talk about designing properties. So ScalaCheck is not a drop-in replacement for other unit testing frameworks. You know, you can definitely use it that way, and you'll get some value. But if we maybe change the way we think about things slightly, we can get a lot more value out of the way we do our tests. And we can get our tests doing a lot more work for us, which is great because then it leaves us to concentrate on slightly more interesting things. So I'm going to run through a little scenario. So there's a game. Uh, I've, I've done this talk a couple of times, and about half the room have never seen to heard of this game, and considering we're not in the UK. So there's a game called Yahtzee, um, and it, it's a dice game. and uh, it's quite similar to poker in that um, you have sets of hands. So if you have all five dice the same, like five of a kind, that's kind of the killer hand. Um, you can have a straight, so all the numbers in a row, so one, two, three, four, five, or two, three, four, five, six. Um, full house, so three of one kind and a pair of another, and so on. So. This here is like the ranking of these, what I call hands. So the higher up the list, the, the better your hand is. So what I thought we could do is, is have a look at trying to test this method here. So given uh, a method maybe we'd have to write for when we're writing this game, uh, a winner, 
So given two hands, which one won? Uh, and this is a, I think that's a fair, a fair um, uh, definition of, of what this API could look like. And I'm sure straight away, you know, I imagine most people here are experienced programmers. We could think of how to test this without using ScalaCheck. Okay, but let's, let's, let's just have a look at how we would do that with ScalaCheck. So here's an idea. So we want to generate two random hands, work out which one of those won, and then call our method and make sure it won. Okay? Yeah? That's, there's nothing, there's no, no, no rocket science here. And, and an implementation might start to look like this. So imagine we've got some arbitrary generators. We know how to make those now for hands. And then we want to compare these. So we want to say, well, if our dice are all the same, then that's Yahtzee. If they're all in a straight, then we've got a, and so on and so on and so on. So we do that for the first dice, and then we do that for the second set of dice. We then work out which one won, and we call our method and make sure that that was the winning one. Yeah, does that all make sense? So what, what, do, we, what do we think to this implementation? Yeah? Yep, that's, that's definitely one thing. There's probably something slightly more fundamental, but that, that's definitely valid, and I will touch on that. Um, is that all we've really done here is re-implemented our application in our test. So that's not really what we want to be doing. You know? And th this is a problem I've often heard people talk about when approaching ScalaCheck. Say, oh, you know, it's great, but I just end up copying the application code into the test, and then, you know, but Let's have another go. Let, let's, let's see what we can do instead. Okay? So here's an, here's an idea. Let's generate some random dice values. We'll construct some hands from those, and then make sure that those hands win. So here's, here's one example. If we want to compare that a Yahtzee, that's five of all the same dice, beats a full house, which was three of one and two of a different um, dice number, we might have something like this. So actually, we need to generate three dice, one for the artsy, and then two for the full house. And also note here that we've got this implication is that we want to make sure that the three of a kind for the full house is different from the pair for the full house. Because if they were the same, actually, that's Yahtzee, right? So then we can do this, generate some hands, and then say, well, if, if the method is this way around, that should work. And if it's the other way around, that should work. That's a lot better, isn't it? Like, we're not, we're not using our implementation. We've, we've got a nice rule here that says this hand should always beat this hand. Go and generate some dice and make sure that works. We still have a few, uh, we still have a few issues with this. One, you said, is that the permutations of the dice positions are not taken into account here. And also, while this is quite a small domain, the comparing all the winning hands is actually quadratic, which for this isn't actually a big deal, but if we had... Say we're dealing with poker, which has a lot more hands and a lot more permutations, and we've got suits to think about and things like that. Th this would be a lot more code to write, you know, because we'd have to test Yahtzee against uh, four of a kind, three of a kind, two pair, things like that. Okay, so can we have maybe a third go, and let's see what we can do here. How about we generate pairs of known hands? So earlier we were testing hands. So we were saying, just generate me some dice and give me a hand. But now we're going to say, let's generate some known hands. And then what we want to do is we get two of those. And we, if we could get to a position where we already know that one hand beats the other, all we've got to do is make sure that that works. OK? Step one, we need, we need to create some generators. So we're going to have a generator for each of the hands. OK? And this could look something like this. So a generator for Yahtzee would look like this. So we want to, we have this, this list of dice, and we want to pick one of those, and then we just put that single dice into a hand. And then whatever gets picked, we're going to end up with Yahtzee hands every time. And then, for instance, do three of a kind could look something like this. So we take one of the dice, we then take another dice that's separate from the one we picked, we then take a third dice that's separate from the two we picked, and then we can generate a hand here. And notice again, I've not taken into account the permutations of the positions, you know, because another hand that would be valid here could be 
D1, D2, D3, D1, D1. Right? Purely for the, for the verbosity on the slides, I've not done that. The code in GitHub actually does take that into account, so I can send that around later. So we've, gen we've, we've created some generators for all of our different hands. And then step two, we want to order the generators to reflect which hand beats another. So can we think of a data type that's quite good for ordering? Lists. Lists are okay for that. So we have a list of generators, and then the closer to the head in the list, the stronger the, the generator. So Yahtzee comes first, three of a kind comes last. And actually, this, this order here is our test, really. This is what we're testing. We want to make sure that this order always holds. OK? So we've got a list of generators. Next step, we're going to partition these generators. So we'll get Scala check to separate that list into two. And then what we'll do, we've then got two lists, and we'll take one generator from one list, and we'll take one generator from another list. And because they were ordered, we should know that the generator from the first list should create hands that beats the generator from the second list. And then wherever Scala check makes that partition, and then whichever generator it picks from either list, that should always hold. And so we can do this kind of like, it can start off with this. So we took our ordered generators. Inside our Scala check test, we pick an index, and then we split there. Just as an aside, the actual Scala check API doesn't fully allow the way I've written the code here. But again, on GitHub it does. And that, that's just a pure limitation of the way the, the API works. But conceptually, this works. And again, this all works fine on the code, but just purely for the slides. And again, I want to have this session about thinking about properties rather than kind of the, the wranglings of Scala check. But basically, the API for Scala check means you have to have two generators and then a list. So you need to work out which generator you'd be picking first. But that's not really something that's of interest here. I just want to be thinking about how to design properties. OK, and then as I said, we're going to take one hand from the better generators and pit it against a hand from the worst generators. So the rest of the code would then look like this. And notice here that I've actually got some nested properties, which is a really nice feature, is that we arbitrarily pick an index, and then we split the generators. And then we randomly we use another property to, to separate these generators, to pick one, one from each. OK, so we can see here that we pick one of the winning generators. We pick one of the losing generators. These create winning and losing hands. And then we make sure that this holds. And then that's great. We run this 100 times, and this just works. So I mean, I, I, think, this is a, I think this is better. It's a much more comprehensive test. It, it, go, it, it shows that you don't need to use the implementation in the first place. And actually, we're just using some rules that, that the uh, that the game should hold. And then we're saying, whatever the implementation, this, the, this, this is how the game should be played. OK. So one thing of slight concern here is, you know, we don't really know what, what we did. Like, we don't know what the test ran. We don't, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a lot of trust put into Scala check here to make sure this worked. And what we could do is, you know, we could put in a, a cheeky, cheeky debug print line while we're, while we're running it, just to make sure that we're, we're getting the kind of test that we thought we would. But there is actually another way we can do this, is that we can actually just get Scarlet to tell us what was run. And there's a collect function. And we can surround our property with this collect. And this takes, it actually takes any type, um, and then we'll print it uh, when the test is run. But I've just done this with strings here. And we can just say, well, we, th this, is, this was what we expected to be the winning hand, and this was what we expected to be the losing hand. And then when we run the test, it looks something like this. So we could see here, Yahtzee was run against four of a kind, 20% of the time, all the way down to a straight beating a full house. And then if you, no, I've not got that there. Um, if you remember the, the ranking of the hands from earlier, the ones on the left here always beat the ones on the right. So our test was kind of doing what we expected. 
And then, of course, just one other thing to notice here um, is there's actually one, one pairing that didn't get run on this test, and that was full house against four of a kind. So a full house beats three of a kind, but testing that a full house beats four of a kind wasn't actually run. Um, if you run the test again, chances are it will happen. You know, this is random. Um, uh, and the, you know, if you continually run these tests, the, the, these kind of permutations happen, and, and you will see that eventually all the tests that you'd expect will be will be covered. Um, uh, and we can look at uh, later in a way to, to get um, some more test runs uh, out of out of what we what we want to do. Remember, this is you know inherently random. Okay, so kind of the final section that I'd like to talk about. Um, it's just some general, general tips and techniques for, for using ScalaCheck. OK, so earlier on, I, I was explaining we can use this implication method. And I, I would try to advise that you, to prefer generators over using implication. So for instance, if we wanted three positive numbers, this is a way we could do that, is that we could just ask for arbitrarily any integers, but then constrain that so that they're always positive. And then when ScholarCheck generates a negative integer, then it skips and, and carries on. And so while you think this is quite, quite straightforward, this actually makes ScholarCheck die, bizarrely. Um, three, if you ask for three positive integers and constrain it, ScholarCheck kind of runs out of steam and says, I, I've given up. I don't think I can do what, what you need me to do, which um, you know, is a bit of a surprise. However. If you just generate positive numbers in the first place, and then you don't need an implication, then this just works as, as you'd expect. There are other ways to do this as well. There's, um, there's a library in the, in the type level family called Refined, which allows you to um, tag types. And that there's a Scala check module for that, which, um, which then allows you to say, you know, I want an integer that is positive. And that's a, a real type. Um, it's just a, an, another way to, to do this. Um, another thing you can do is, is you can label generators as well. Uh, and this gives clearer meaning to the data you've generated. So say, for instance, we wanted, I don't know, some kind of database and some kind of input value. Um, hopefully by now, um, you probably understand that this test will fail pretty quickly because it's possible, you know, this will generate an empty map, and then, of course, trying to get something from an empty map will, will never work. Um, what we can do is we, we can label these generators um, using this operator here, and then when we run our test, this, this makes things a little bit clearer as to what we're doing. So, again, while this is quite a small example, you know, imagine if you had a dozen generators as part of your test, and maybe the types are are similar for some of those uh, generators. It can be quite confusing after this test start failing six months after you've written it as to, to what generator does what. But we can label these, and then we can say, well, look, the lookup database actually ended up being empty, and the index we were looking for was, was here. Okay? As well as labeling generators, we can label properties. So, and this, this is better than printing, just calling a print line as well. So say, for instance, here, here's a property. Given two integers, if you take the larger integer and square it, it should be greater than the smaller integer that is squared as well. Okay, And then when we do that, we just get numbers on the screen. And again, this can be quite confusing as to, to what, what happens here. But what we can do is using the same operator, however, assigning it to the property, we can put, we can put a string with that. And what you can see I've done here is I've actually included the, the values that were generated and also the, operate, the result of the operation we did to them as well. So we've got this really powerful mechanism of saying, I was given this, I worked out that I needed to make it this value, and then print it. And this, this actually is a lot clearer than, than doing a print line, because if we do a print line, every single time the test is run, it will print, which means when the test succeeds, it prints. When a test fails, it prints. And really, all we care about here is a failed case. And as well, when uh, a test fails, ScalaCheck will attempt to shrink it. So 
if we just use a print line, is that all of a sudden it starts printing for all the shrink cases as well. And ScalaCheck will come across some more succeeding tests when it starts to shrink because it's trying to work out the boundary between success and failure. Okay? So another way, and th this comes back to designing properties as well, is that we can think about actually generating successful and failed data as part of our generator. So I've got this, um, I've got this method here, which I pr um, I've tried to make it as general as possible. And given any two types, and as long as we have arbitrary type class instances for those types, we can generate this, this type here. So it's a map of A to Bs and then two lists of As. And then what, what this code is saying here is that it's saying this first list will always give you values for which there is a value in the map. So you know that this list here, you can pull values out of the map and that should always work. And this list here is that this is a list of values for which they don't appear in the map. So then straight away we've now got a generator which works, maybe we want to really generate a map, but we've got two sets of data which we know that calling this map should succeed and calling this map should not succeed. So for instance, you could imagine wiring this up to some kind of service where we were, say, um, pretending to be a database, um, stubbing or mocking out a database, and then we can create some calls to the database that we would expect to succeed and some calls to the database that we should expect to fail. Okay? And here's, here's just a, a very, very simple Im implementation of that. So all the succeeds should work and all the fails should, should not be in the map. Okay? So ScalaCheck by default runs 100 tests, which we've already seen is that not actually comprehensive enough for when it came to our, our Yahtzee um, implementation earlier. But we, we can just change that very, very simply with this, with this parameter inside SBT. And so here we could see that we ran with 100 tests, but actually we could say that we actually want to run this with a million, and then clearly this, this is going to take longer. Um, but then may, maybe this is some kind of implementation you might want to put on your CI server, which might take a, a, quite a lot longer, but you know, time isn't as important there. So you could have a fairly comprehensive suite of tests when running it locally, but then maybe some overnight tests or just check-in tests. We would really want to make sure that we're, we're a lot more covered here. And this stuff all, all integrates well with, with most of the code coverage tools as well. Okay. One, one more type I'd like to talk about is cogen. Um, so we looked at um, gen earlier. Um, and then from a category theory point of view, this is the jewel of gen. Um, we're not actually going to look at the implementation, but I, I just want to explain how this is used and why this is important. So before the most recent release of ScalaCheck 1.13, one um, if you wanted to generate functions, this is what would happen. Um, so we'd arbitrarily say get integers to strings. We'll just pull, pull that out for the, for the REPL. And then we can see here that the, the return type, the return value from our function is the same. Now, it might just be the case that I got really unlucky here, and for these two input values, the output value is the same. But in reality, that's not actually true. Um, the implementation of um, the generator for functions would ignore the input type and would just generate a single value for the output type and then give you a function. So it's not quite, it's not, it's not great for, for, for dealing with functions. And ways around that and that I've used in the past was maybe looking back at that um, pick um, earlier where I'd say, well, um, let's use a map instead. And then we've got a suite of values that we'd expect to, to work in, in some particular way. However, um, yeah, sorry, and you can see here that actually I, I'm proving, well, not proving, but doubling down on the fact that um, the values are the same here. And so what happens is that if you wanted to create a, a function, an arbitrary function, all you actually needed was a generator or an implicit arbitrary for the B, so the return type of the function. It didn't care about the A. But now with Cogen, so from Scala 113 onwards, um, 
we, we, we have a much more comprehensive way of working with functions. So um, what happens here is that as long as there's a cogen instance for our input type, then we can create a gen for our A to B. And um, Eric Osheim, who implemented this, gave a talk uh, Lambda World earlier this month where he, he went into a lot of the internals. And it, it effectively um, disturbs the, um, the seed for the random generator um, with the input that you, you, the input type that you give it. So from now, all you need is a cogen of the input type and a generator of the output type, and that gives you a generator for the function. Okay. Um, one, one last thing I'd like to talk about uh, is boilerplate reduction. Um, and we can reduce a lot of the, a lot of the boilerplate code we've seen today um, using this library Scala check shapeless. And this uses um, the automatic type class derivation in, in, Scala, in shapeless. Um, you can get this by importing or using this dependency in, in SBT. And a full example, no smoke and mirrors, honest, is um, we can create uh, any old type here. And then uh, Scala check shapeless gives us this import. And then we want to import our arbitrary function. And then now we can do things like this. So arbitrary for coordinates and just take uh, um, an arbitrary value for that straight away. We've not created any generators. We've not created any arbitraries. All we've done is this import here. And that, that gets often a lot of the way of what you actually need when using your own types but want to use it with shapeless. Uh, sorry, with Scala check. OK, so this can derive any arbitrary for a particular type as long as the following rules hold. The type is a case class or it's a sealed family of case classes, so an algebraic data type. Um, and that an arbitrary can be summoned for all the constituent parts. So if we looked here, we could see from, you know, from what we've talked about today is that we can summon arbitraries for integers and strings. And so that's why this worked. And this, this can be summoned either through automatic derivation or otherwise. So if we have a case class with a case class inside, is that when the outer one tries to generate its arbitrary, it will see an internal one, and it will automatically derive that, and so on, until it gets down to actually deriving um, ar arbitrary values for which there is a type class instance. One thing to be aware of is that compile times do dramatically increase, but that's going to change in the near future, I believe. Yes. Yes. And um, I have one, one final thing I'd like to talk about today, and that's a library I've been working on with 47 degrees. Um, it's, it's in very early stage right now. Um, but the idea is this is going to be a library for generating sensible dates with Scala check. So, you know, a kind of naive implementation of, of dates uh, with Scala check might be to create a a random long and then make a millisecond date stamp out of that and then and then work with that. But of course that means then that you you can arbitrarily produce dates in the prehistoric era or into the far future, which is probably not what you want for your domain. So what this tries to do is it tries to this gives you generators which allows you to generate um, timestamps within a range. So you could say for instance uh, I want to generate a time from now for the next year, or from six weeks ago to a month from now, things like that. And then also, um, as we'll, I'll show in a second, um, this then allows you to um, uh, arbitrarily pick the granularity of your generated timestamps. So if your domain, for instance, only cares about the nearest day, then this will never create millisecond or second or hours. It will always generate to the nearest day or year or you know, what, whatever your domain needs is that that's kind of the idea behind this. So this is a very brief example. Um, so it provides this function here, gen date time within range. And then when I put this slide on uh, the 1st of September, it was this time. 
uh, and then I say I want to generate a range from now, being the 1st of September, for seven days from now. And then the, these were the, the first three dates that I sampled, and you can see that they're all within seven days of the, of the given time. Uh, there's some more information and some documentation about it at this website. Um, it's at a 0.1 release. Um, I know a couple of people are using it. Um, if people had feedback, that would be great. This works out of the box right now with Joda Time and Java 8's date time APIs, just with the relevant imports. Um, if there's something you need from it, you know, talk to me, and hopefully we'll, we'll get that in a, in a roadmap before a, a 1.0 release. That's all I had time to talk about. Um, I'll send these slides around. We've got the code for the talk um, and some more um, information about it here. This book, um, the Scala Check Definitive Guide, is really good. And uh, that provided a lot of the inspiration for the talk. And that's from the guy who wrote the library in the first place. Um, that's all I had. So if anyone had any, any questions, I'd be, I'd be glad to take them now. No, the, the, there this, um, this, this does tend to um, concentrate, not concentrate, but it, it's not random. So, you know, it will, under the hood, it says, you know, I want to create a month. Uh, sorry, I want to create um, a day of the month, and I know I've already created, say, February, so it would only ever create not day 1 to 28 or, you know, it's a leap year. So that's all considered within the library. So that's kind of the idea here. Yeah. And second question, what about the, we have a, we are using Scala check and one issue is like, if you have the Yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I don't quite understand. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if there's if there's rules, sorry, yeah. So the um, the question was, uh, if you have rather than having multiple inputs, like you know we have with the Yahtzee, where we took two hands and wanted to work out which one won. Uh, if we only had one input, that effectively maps to a boolean. Um, well, I mean, I suppose if you think about the the very first example with length. Um, is that, that that's a rule rather than a, a mapping, is it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've not really thought. I mean, I suppose when I've done it, I've generally had more than one input into these. Cause it, I suppose it's more a lot of the interest and a lot of the, the, the kind of problems occur, you know, with multiple inputs. Uh, that's a really bad answer. I'm sorry. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've come across a case where that's been such an issue. Yeah, question at the back. Yeah, so the, ge the generator is, is the workhorse, as it were. That's, that's what actually goes and what, you know, produces the random values. Um, it, it also holds monad laws and things like that, so it, we can combine these to create other generators. Um, arbitrary is... The way I think of arbitrary is almost like a marker class to, to give to a generator. And then where we saw with the for all, um, uh, I'll go, I'll, 
So the, the for all method, that has an implicit parameter on it for arbitraries. So you've effectively told the compiler that this generator, I'm going to wrap it in an arbitrary and make it implicit. That's the generator that works for that type. So I, I generally think of arbitrary as just a marker for the most general generator that is then summoned when we use, say, the for all function. Um, so the, the real work is in the generators. And that's why we often have different ones of those. So with strings, we can have lots of them. But really, we only want one arbitrary string, because that's what gets called on for all, where we don't pass any generators in. Okay. Any other? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think. I think. Uh, I think probably the the problem I've I've had with that is that this comes back to kind of creating a conversation. Is that if you're getting random failures, then I think Scala check is just showing what it can, and it's saying you know look, effectively that there's there's an issue here. You know, it's kind of up to you to sort it out, really. Um, I think that really just shows that the, there's, there's issues with the underlying things that are being called. Um, again, Scala check is not a silver bullet. Um, it's just saying, you know, you know effectively, if, if you can't reproduce the same values with given inputs, then that's saying that there's some kind of issue with the underlying things. I think, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, not off the top of my head. It, w it would be nice, though, wouldn't it? Is that we could say, you know, this test. Yeah. Um, the nice thing is, is that um, Scala check gives the inputs that caused it to fail. So it would be really nice if we could then go and automatically generate the method, a test that did that always. Um, I believe in an upcoming version of Scala check, um, the the seed is going to be given when a test fails. And then at least you can always reproduce it that way. Um, but uh, no, you can't kind of automatically go and generate a class, a test for you. Yeah, yeah, for now, yeah. Any other, any other questions? OK, sorry, I've run out of time. Come and find me afterwards. But thanks for, thanks for listening.